Hello and welcome back to our introduction to plasma physics or plasma physics survey course. Today it's lecture eight. Well, technically lecture eight is not happening today. I'm recording it today. But whenever you watch it, that's going to be lecture eight. You will remember what we've been uh, discussing in lecture seven. We talked about um, the first adiabatic invariant. We just called it the adiabatic invariant, which is a word that uh, here Apple doesn't know. And we call we talked about the mirror effect. Now, as I mentioned, we could spend more time <clears throat> talking about the mirror effect and particle motion in mirror geometry, but we'll um, leave that uh, for reading uh, because it's, I hope, sufficiently simple. It's actually not terribly complicated, and we want to spend some more time talking about um, some more exciting things, even though you know, mirror motion itself is actually pretty interesting and it can be pretty important in uh, some places that hopefully we'll be able to discuss in class. Now, as for the adiabatic invariant, as I just said, Really, what we talked about is what is called the first adiabatic, adiabatic invariant. You may guess that where there is a first, there must be a second. And you may not be too surprised there is also a third. I will not discuss them in this course. They are actually, they have uh, some importance. In fact, uh, they're not useless uh, curiosities, but we have to, make our choices and decide what uh, we can really talk about. In this case, what we have decided, what we is me, you know, royal we, it's up to me, but also we're discussing things in class. So we, we're having conversations about what is interesting and what is not. We're going to talk a little bit more about the first adiabatic invariant, and then we'll move on to some other things. Now, I'm going to refer to the first adiabatic in invariant as the, the adiabatic invariant. That is what normally happens in uh, plasma physics. When people say ad adiabatic invariant, they invariably mean the first adiabatic invariant, the one we've talked about, unless they specify a qualifier such as the second or the third adiabatic invariant. Okay, then we're going to talk about the adiabatic invariant in <clears throat> a very mag magnetic field. And I'm going to leave some uh, details for you to think about. If you haven't figured it out, okay, that's a bit of a problem <laughs> because there's going to be, there, there has been a lot of details that I intentionally left unspecified so that you could think about them. And I did ask you about some of those in uh, the class assignments. But, Hopefully you will see 
uh, and you will ask yourselves what um, what about x the the parts i'm not telling you now first thing i need to specify is uh, what do i mean by um, varying magnetic field i did this pretty badly i jumped again and did my square around here so let me fix that okay what i mean here is magnetic field in a time uh, i'm sorry adiabatic inv uh, invariant in a time varying field that is the all the only variation we will consider then of course you immediately know that well if there is a change in over time of the magnetic field i'm going to have an induced electric field because the curl of v is minus the time derivative of uh, the magnetic field you may also notice that i'm using a thicker pencil for writing my equations i'm grateful to the unnamed benefactor that pointed out to me that my equations were a little thin a little hard to see on the screen and so i'm making them a little bigger that is a little thicker can't write any bigger that's as, as good as i can do okay now if there is an electric field and i follow the particle motion in uh, my field configuration over uh, gyration my particle <clears throat> my charge particle will see some work done by the electric field and uh, <clears throat> that work is going to be Oops, I didn't mean to move this. Okay, that work is going to be given by the integral of essentially Q times C in DL. But I have to be careful uh, about the signs. But in um, absolute value, And here I'm being a little sloppy if I hope you notice because this integral itself is um, not necessarily positive, but up to a sign, this is what the integral is going to be. <clears throat> Where again, by the symbol W here, I mean work. All right, then, of course, by Stokes' theorem, we also know that the integral over a loop of E dot DL is minus the integral over the surface surrounded by that loop of, uh, me for convenience, also indicate the time derivative of the magnetic field as b dot b dot 
dot ds, where ds is the vector <clears throat> perpendicular to the surface. You know all this from physics 2 or calculus 2 or <laughs> some other number, not necessarily 2 of some other course. But anyway, this is all stuff you know very well. And this is also the variation of the flux of the magnetic field through um, the surface over time. Then if you go and um, figure out the signs, you know that for gyration motion, the signs of uh, DL um, and Oops, can I remove it from here? DL and V perp times Q have opposite signs. Therefore, uh, sorry, oops, in the absolute value. Uh, no, sorry, what am I doing? Got confused about what I was writing. Okay, so this is good. And uh, now I'm going to write the integral with the correct sign. Sorry about that. The work done over one gyration. <clears throat> is going to be equal to minus integral of absolute value of q d e dot d l equal again i have now two minus signs so i have absolute value of q integral of the surface of b dot dot ds which is Again, following the lines above, absolute value of Q <clears throat> times d phi dt. And let me emphasize again, maybe with a prettier uh, arrow, that no. Oops, sorry, we're having technical problems. Let me pause this for a moment. Okay, we're back. I sorted out the technical issues and I managed to type magnetic flux, which is what I wanted to, to do. This uh, work done by the electric field that's due to the variation of the magnetic field over time is then equal to the charge of the particle times the variation, the time derivative of um, the uh, magnetic flux, which I can write as absolute value of the charge times b dot times d the area where here the area doesn't change the only thing that's changing is b and i'm not going to get any deeper into this point but if you need a hint this is the place where we're making assumptions about um, our system and where our derivation could break if uh, those assumptions are not satisfied. 
at any rate, that's work that's done by the electric field. And that work, because of the way we set up the system, is work that only affects the perpendicular component of the velocity. Therefore, I can write that that work is equal to the variation of um, the kinetic energy that is associated with the perpendicular velocity. So that delta W, my work over one gyration again, <clears throat> is going to be equal to the variation of the kinetic energy that only depends on V perp. If there is a piece with V parallel that doesn't change, that's what I'm saying really. And we just said that this is equal to absolute value of Q times uh, B dot, the expression I have in the previous line, times pi times Larmor radius square. But the Larmor radius uh, itself, I can express in terms of the velocity, uh, perpendicular velocity, and or the mass of the particle and um, of the magnetic field. I'm not going to do all the steps, but putting pieces together, what I get is one to one more step, two pi. B dot M over absolute value of Q times B times one half of MV per square over B, where B is the absolute value of B. Now these two pieces clearly come from the square of the Larmor radius. And just replace the expression for the Larmo radius and squared it and put all my pieces together. I need a one half, so I got a two times one half. And the reason why I wrote it this way is that if I write it this way, I recognize that this is actually two pi times B dot divided by the absolute value of omega. If um, with the final omega with a sign. Remember, we said much earlier on that depending on the textbooks or even just depending on the situation, we may decide to define the cyclotron frequency, the duration frequency, either as the absolute value of the frequency or as a value with a sign that will then give us not only the frequency, but also the direction of the duration. But that was the first piece. And the second piece is just the adiabatic invariant. Well then, let's uh, <clears throat> do one more step. And you'll see where this is. Now I'm just going to take this and multiply by omega, absolute value of omega over two pi and obtain the following. The, or, Rather, let me write it this way. Um, okay. The time derivative, let me make this a little more clear. The time derivative of the kinetic energy that is associated with the perpendicular velocity of this quantity is equal to the work that's done over one generation motion divided by the time that it takes to do the generation motion, which is absolute value of omega divided by two pi, which is what I have in the 
expression on the other side times delta one half mass v per square and now i'm going to fix this here writing everything in latex i cannot bear brackets not matching okay so but this is the expression we just wrote on the line above this is equal to b dot times mu or mu times db dt to write more explicitly what be what we meant by b dot <clears throat> again here we're just using the absolute value we're working with scalars here now last step what is the time derivative of uh, this kinetic energy when you may wonder well you just draw it yes but that's not the only way i can write it if you remember the relation between the adiabatic invariant and the perpendicular velocity and the magnetic field this is actually the time derivative of mu times b we've used this before already but this is also equal to mu times db over dt from my previous line and so well, obviously the time derivative of mu must be zero which is exactly what we're hoping to obtain okay i wasn't hoping i knew the answer already but that's what i was trying to show you now um, please do notice one important piece here that this quantity is not zero the adiabatic invariant does not change but if b is changing the kinetic energy of the particle is actually increasing or decreasing if uh, b the time derivative of b is negative <clears throat> but i'm not using conservation of energy in the sense that energy is conserved but rather in the sense that the time variation of energy is given by the work I'm doing on the system and I'm using that information to show that for my conservation of uh, energy to be satisfied the adiabatic invariant must be uh, indeed an invariant in time well that's what we wanted to discuss about um, time varying magnetic fields now we're going to move to something that's going to be really surprising after time varying magnetic fields is anybody going to expect that we're going to talk about time varying electric fields well that's what we're going to do but we're going to do things a little differently in fact <clears throat> what um, is going to happen here is that we're going to find that there is yet another drift that is associated with the time variation of the electric field and um, for the sake of uh, for once kind of seeing things in a um, couple of different ways hopefully we'll have time within uh, today i will um, try to show this in um, in more with using more than one approach but let's uh, start from the simplest uh, intuitive approach i'm going to look at uh, 
my pen and realize that I'm using the wrong one, I'm going to you look at my expression for the drift velocity due to e cross b. Then let me call it e cross b for now. And then I will probably just call it vdrift to save uh, some trouble in trying to write this small expression here. But you remember what that expression is. It's like the grandfather of all drifts. It's the first one we looked at. And uh, that expression is uh, given by e cross b divided by b squared. Now, we are looking at a situation where the time derivative of the electric field is not zero, but the time derivative of the magnetic field is zero, one piece at a time. Okay, then <clears throat> what is the time derivative of my drift velocity? Well, let's see. That's going to be equal to the time derivative of this messy quantity that I have here, e cross b divided by b square. But since everything else is um, only dependent on B, which is not changing in time, this is going to be equal to the time derivative of E, which I'm going to indicate with E dot again, cross B divided by B squared. where again, E dot is usual notation, the time derivative of the electric field. Okay, now I've kind of assumed that there will be a time derivative of uh, the drift velocity and figure out what the expression was, or if you prefer, I thought if um, the, the electric field changes in time, what is the derivative of the expression I have on the right-hand side of the expression for the E cross B velocity? Well, then that total the derivative of the total expression must be equal to the derivative of the velocity by a dog biting its tail doesn't matter which way you look at it what matters is that you end up with a time varying uh, drift velocity a time varying velocity we hopefully all agree is uh, an acceleration but if there is an acceleration, I can define a force. You can you know, think about it a little more carefully, have more worries about, uh, okay, now what? what is really, what, what, what frame of reference are we actually working in? Well, we're looking at um, the motion in the frame of reference of the guiding center, which is was moving with a constant velocity, but now it, it's accelerating. And uh, if it's accelerating, I can write the force as um, this expression that 
I okay. I'm very sorry for the technical issues today. I clicked the wrong button again. Okay, let's try again. In the frame of reference of the guiding center, we see this force, which is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which is the derivative of the velocity. That is the derivative of e cross b over b squared. I don't like that. Or uh, if you prefer e dot cross b over b squared, as we just wrote. Now, here is where it gets interesting, I hope. We have a force. Do you remember what a force does in uh, our plasma for a, a single particle, really for a single particle moving with uh, within uh, magnetic uh, field, constant magnetic field, well, that force is going to create a drift that's going to be given by one over Q times the force cross B divided by B squared. Well, then let's replace the expression for the force. Well, then that's the expression. Let's see what we can do. This is going to give me that my drift velocity <clears throat> is equal to one over Q. And then I take the force from above. I've got a mass times time derivative of e cross b over b square all cross b over b square So collecting pieces, this is not difficult. I'm going for once to do a few more steps. This is going to give me the mass that I take from up here, divided by Q times B square. Q times B square, here we go. Times <clears throat> the derivative of e cross b over b square dot, I'm sorry, cross b. And uh, <clears throat> this you can uh, right and um, in a different way actually it turns out that that's what's most convenient <clears throat> is to say well since b itself is constant and that's the reason why i've been writing it the, the expression in this way is that I'm just going to put everything inside the derivative. M over Q B square. 
times the time derivative of E cross B over B square cross B. Now, this <clears throat> expression here is um, what the life of plasma physics is made of. We are the products, but this I can write, well, one over B squared is a scalar and therefore is not going to matter in my cross product. And I can take it all up uh, in front or put it anywhere I like. And what I like is to put it in front. This is going to be one over B squared times E cross B cross B. And this expression here is what you find, for instance, in the plasma formula as A cross, uh, sorry, my alphabet is not my strongest point, A cross B cross C. That is the cross product of two vector second first and then we take the cross product of the result of that cross product with another vector now i'm going to do this um slowly and carefully not because it's difficult but because you may not be all that used to this type of calculation at, uh, yet at this stage so i want to show you how we normally do these things i look up my plasma formula and i find actually what i have is a cross b cross c which is now the same as b cross c cross a with a minus sign where B oops I was supposed to change color here where B in my expression above would be E this C would be B and A would be also B that's what i'm working on i left myself a little bit more space oh well confused yet <clears throat> don't worry it's normal all right minus sign here okay then let me get back up here this a cross b cross c is equal to a dot c times b minus a dot b times c now a dot C, A was B, C is B as well. So this is B square, B was E times E minus A dot B, well, A was B, B was E. So this is, I'm going to write it as E dot B, 
which is of course a scalar and c is b again but this has, has the opposite sign with respect to what I was trying to obtain. So putting pieces together, one over b square e cross b cross b is equal to e dot b times b Ah, didn't leave the space for the one over b square. My bad. One over b square e dot b times b, the second term, since I'm changing sign, minus b square times e. Okay, so let's see <clears throat> how we're doing here. Well, B was um, a constant. So when I take the time derivative of this thing here, I'm only going to have to take derivatives of E. So let's see how I can sort this out. E dot B, I can write as E parallel times B. That's my definition of um, <clears throat> E parallel is the component of E that's parallel to B. And uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, then I have to take um, uh, a B. Uh, I have to keep track of the absolute uh, values so that I can write that way <clears throat> or I can insert um, another b divided by uh, absolute value of b uh, for convenience that is if uh, I keep <clears throat> my other b which I've not left space for so let me stick to this part let me try to be a little more clean e dot b hat which is e dot vector b divided by absolute value of b i'm going to call E parallel. Okay, now I can make this work a, a little better. And uh, E dot B times B, I'm going to write as. E parallel scalar times <clears throat> the absolute value of B times the absolute value of B times B hat. Or E parallel. B square uh, 
b hat or by definition of e parallel b square e parallel vector. What I really want to get to is to write the two pieces I have in my square brackets as b squared times something. And uh, you see that you're going to have now the difference between e parallel and d or e and d parallel, depending on how you, um, you want to write the equation. That's going to give you only the perpendicular component of the field. Okay, here's where things went wrong. I did all my derivation without without looking looking at nodes, and now I see that, oops, uh, not so good. I'm getting the wrong sign because I have a wrong sign at, at the beginning. But let let's just look at the absolute value, and then we'll uh, worry about the sign. Okay, so what? Uh, we had was the expression that is going to give us come on, the additional drift was m over q b uh, q b square actually times the time derivative of um, E cross B cross B, which I'm writing as B square, one over B square. E cross B cross B. And we show that this is going to give us m over q b square time derivative of having written it this way well let me do it um as we have it, which is with the wrong sign. <laughs> e parallel minus E times B square over B. That will give us minus again wrong sign because I started with the the wrong sign. Everything is all, all the steps are correct. There is just a minus sign in front of everything. So please don't get confused. And uh, also be reassured that we're going to do this again in uh, a different way, and that's going to give us the uh, correct expression now okay so mass divided by qb squared times the time derivative of the perp where e perp to avoid any possible confusion is the component of the electric field per that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. this quantity with the correct sign 
is called the polarization drift. Okay, we found us a new drift. <clears throat> Notice that this will um, actually also occur if you have a sudden variation or a fast variation of um, the electric field or at least the perpendicular component of the electric field now i see we don't have a lot of time left but let's uh, let's at least get started Oof, that is not what I meant. So let's do the math again properly, and we are going to do it in um, a slightly different way. <clears throat> We're not trying to be as clever, and we'll just take it um, step by step. What I wanted to show you with the previous derivation is how you work with vectors and uh, how you group things. That may be faster once you get um, a little more used to it, uh, but it, it's going to look more time consuming at the beginning. The way we can do this with being less smart and more careful is actually starting from the equations of motion and i like to just keep a plus or minus sign in the derivation you may feel like i'm cheating but let me let me just do it that way to keep up with the uh, the way it's done in uh, one of my favorite textbooks that's uh, actually the goals not rather for textbook um, once again i'm not always following the exact steps in our textbook so that you can see things done in uh, slightly different ways okay so here's what we're going to do we're going to write the the equations of motion and i'm afraid that's all we're going to be able to do today here we go the derivative of um, the x component so dvx dt as usual i'm working the x y plane while the magnetic field is in uh, the positive z direction this is going to give me q times b over m times vy plus q over m this is just the lorentz force lorentz force times e x which is a function of t and uh, 
the time derivative of the y component of the velocity is going to be uh, analogous is going to have minus v y that multiplies I'm sorry minus vx that multiplies q times b over m q times b over m times vx and then there is going to be the piece q over m ey function of time where again b is in the z direction Now, to make life a little simpler, I'm going to assume that the electric field is in the x direction. It's time dependent, but it's in the dx direction, which means that EY is zero. Am I making a very special assumption here? Well, think about it for a second. Clearly, the answer is no, because as long as I keep the direction of my magnetic field unchanged, I can set the directions x and y in the plane that's perpendicular to the magnetic field in any way I want. That means that I'm just going to decide that the electric field is constant in direction but changing in an absolute value. And uh, I'm going to pick the direction of that uh, electric field as my x direction. We'll, um, we'll get to that later. Let me just try one more step and then we'll have to close it for today. I was hoping to get to the end of this, but going through the details of uh, the derivation was uh, actually more time consuming than I expected. Okay, dvx dt is equal to qb over m. Well, I'm going to write this as omega sub c. The plus or minus is because I'm going to assume here that omega sub c is positive. times Vy, and here I have Q over M. Well, this I can write as omega C over B times Vx. And here I keep stressing this is a function of T, while the time derivative of Vy is going to be equal to minus plus, I got a minus sign, so I switched the plus or minus, omega c times vx. Um. I'm defining the cyclotron frequency to be positive. <clears throat> then it's um, easy to uh, put uh, the, the pieces together. We have 
done this before. I take um, the time derivative of the first equation substituting the second one and, and vice versa. And I obtain the two equation going to write them both. Second derivative of Vx with respect to t squared is equal to minus omega c times Vx. Oops, okay, omega c squared times Vx plus or minus omega c over b times the time derivative. I'm going to write it as a partial derivative, but we'll later assume that the electric field only depends on time and does not depend on position. It really doesn't matter all that much. And uh, the second equation, the one for Vy, is going to be identical except that in this case I do not have the time derivative. Okay, so that's a good place to stop. We'll stop here and we will pick it up on the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.